All right, we're going to do a uh, another sermon request today. This one is going to be don't really have a real great title for it, but I, I'll say it's uh, seducing female pastors. And I'm not advocating that you should seduce them. I'm saying that they are seducing people. So what are the qualifications for a pastor according to Scripture? We're going to start out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. One of Paul, one of his converts, was a young man named Timothy. And so Paul is in, in writing to Timothy, but this is instruction for any anyone who wants to be a preacher. And I say anyone because we're going to define here in just a minute who the anyone is. It's not any man or woman, it's a man. And the Bible is very, very clear about that. So we're going to look here at why female pastors are not scriptural. All right, starting out here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. All right, there's, this is a true saying here. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, a bishop there is your Bible word, another Bible word for pastor. Okay, it's not some kind of a high up position in the archdiocese or some kind of nonsense. No, it's just a word for a pastor. Uh, look at verse two. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. How can you have a female pastor as a bishop? A female pastor cannot be the husband of one wife, in spite of what some of the lesbian women try to do. <laughs> But it says here, the, uh, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We're going to stop there for just a second. Is there any way that you could fit a female pastor into that? No. Absolutely not. Unless you use a different Bible, which we're going to hit in just a couple minutes here. I'm going to show you that this has been changed in some of the new versions. Why? Well, because they're satanic. Uh, but you say, well, then maybe not a pastor, but how about a deaconess? You know, how about that? Well, look at verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave. Not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon, well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Can there be women deacons? No. You can't be a woman deacon and have a wife. All right? Sodomy is, is not accepted by God. So you can't fit it in there. You know, you say, well, I don't understand. You know, aren't equal, aren't women equal to men? No, women are not equal to men. Why? Because God has created women for a different purpose. You can't take a, something that's created for a separate purpose, a very special purpose. Women are very honored in God's sight. Why would you want to make a woman like a man? Or a man like a woman? Why? Well, because people are going against the created order that God has established for a man and for a woman. <clears throat> All right? It's not a. It's not some kind of a. Oh, it's it's a dishonorable thing to be a woman in God's sight. No, it isn't. God has a very uh, honorable thing for women out there, but it's not to be like a man. Now I want to talk here, real quickly, about the biblical hierarchy. Okay, the way things work. And what you have is you have God, then man. Actually, Jesus Christ is between God and man. He's the mediator between us. Um, but then after that, you have women and then you have children. That's the way God has ordained the, the pyramid, if you will, because you spell that thing out, it kind of goes down like that. That's the way it's supposed to be. God, man, women, children. Everybody has that 
their place there. And we're going to talk about that as we continue here. Ephesians chapter 5. Turn back there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5.22. We're going to see here about the thing of, of a married couple. And we're going to see this relationship that I'm talking about where you have the husband is the head of the wife. The wife is supposed to be submissive to her husband. We're going to see that here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Okay, it says here, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in some things. You need to be looking here. It doesn't say in some things, it says in everything. That's what it says there. Okay? You say, I don't agree with that. Okay, then take it up with the Lord. I didn't write it. And, you, you know, you, a lot of women will say, but my husband isn't any good. He's he's rotten and stuff. Well, then you shouldn't have married him, you know. And I'll tell you right now, a young Christian woman, I believe, should start praying for a godly husband as soon as she's old enough to, you know, know that she'd like to get married someday. You know, a lot of young girls think that boys are gross, you know. And actually, when they're little, you know, most boys are kind of gross. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, when a, when a girl gets old enough, she should start saying, God, give me a godly husband. And then wait till he does. Don't go out and seek him from the world. Wait till, you, till God provides a godly man for you to marry. See, might that, that might take a while. Yeah, it might. But look at uh, verse 25. He said, well, this, this is so sexist and, and, and all this other stuff. This is, this is putting women down. You know, it's not very honorable for women. Uh, no, we need to continue reading there. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So you see, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm a, a man here and soon, you know, soon I'm actually going to be getting married, and so I'm just going to put my wife down all the time. And I'm going to treat her like dirt. I'm going to say, you need to submit to me. That isn't it. A husband is supposed to honor his wife. So when I say today that a woman is not supposed to be a pastor, I don't hate women because I said that. What we're looking at here is the biblical roles that God has ordained. Women are not supposed to rule over men. How can a woman pastor have a relationship with her husband? She is his spiritual authority. See, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. You know, and the Bible is very clear. A man is to be a bishop and he is to have the oversight. He's to teach. He's to preach. So it does not work, the thing of a female pastor. Now you can, well, we'll, we'll just come back to it, I guess, I guess here. But First Peter chapter 3, we're going to go there next. We're going to come back here to Ephesians chapter 5 if you want to keep your hand there. But First uh, Peter chapter 3, and uh, <clears throat> while you're turning there, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 30, you'll notice there are three things mentioned there that a man is supposed to do for his wife. And that is, he's to love her, he's to nourish her, and he's to cherish her. He's supposed to provide for her. He's supposed to give her a position of honor. But uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start here at verse 1. Okay, it says here, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, 
which is in the sight of God of great price. Again, let me stop there for just a second. Now, if you're a woman, you ought to read through the Bible and say, what does God consider a great thing for women? And then you should strive to please the Lord. All right, you got to keep that in mind. It is, if you are a woman, if you are a wife, you do want to please your husband, but more so than that, you want to please the Lord. That's what you should do. And it says there, a meek and quiet spirit, in the sight of, which is in the sight of God of great price. That's something to remember. How can you be a pastor as a woman and have a meek and quiet spirit? Now, I don't advocate a man standing up there preaching and screaming and yelling and, and you know, you know, I have a sermon on that. But the point is, a preacher has to be a little bit gruff sometimes. You know, as a pastor, I have to preach against sins. Your sins and even my sins. How can you do that as meek and quiet? Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not supposed to be meek, but I'm, all I'm saying is, you know, it just doesn't line up with what God wants for a woman. Verse 5. For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. And again, you know, women will say, well, this is so hard on women. Keep reading. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know what happens when a husband does not honor his wife and he starts to treat her poorly? Your prayers are hindered if you're a man. You want answers to prayer, you want God to bless your life, you have to honor your wife. And you know why they're weaker? Because God creates women to be more sensitive so that they can raise children. Remember the structure that God has set up. God, man, woman, children. Can a man raise children? Yeah, somewhat. But a man just does not have the ability to be as sensitive as a woman. You know, the women women just have that gift, that women's intuition, you know, they say, or the, the mother, you know, in them. They have that ability to, to love children better than, than, and to understand children better than a man can. All right? And that's the way God has created it. It's not a dishonorable thing. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. <clears throat> okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay? Now, what does this thing of the man leaving his father and mother mean? Well, it's talking about authority. All right? You know, when you are a single man and you're, you know, you're still under your parents' authority, essentially... And especially the woman, she's still under her father's authority. That's why at the, the wedding ceremony, the father gives away the bride. And then when that happens, those two become one flesh. The husband and the wife, that new union, they become one flesh. But what's it, what's it mean there when it says, what is the great mystery of verse 32? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. What's going on there? Well, what happens when you are born into this world? You are born into sin. Right? Adam, as in Adam, all die. You are born. Now, you're not going to be held accountable by God if you die as a young baby or even young child before what we would say is the age of accountability. But if you get old enough that you can understand that you're a sinner and you die, well, then you'll go to hell. Why? Because your father is the devil, according to Scripture. Everybody out there in the world, their father is Satan, essentially, because they, they will do things to please their father, <laughs> you know. But what happens when you get saved? And I, this is a whole other study. I can't get into all the details here, but the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. So when we get saved as Christians, we actually leave our father, the devil, 
And we go and we are now married to Jesus Christ. Now, as many of you have heard in my last week's announcement, and you know we're getting more plans finalized here, June 2nd of this year, I'm actually going to be getting married. Now, guess what happens? My life as a single guy ceases to exist. All right? I don't understand all the implications of that yet, but I'm sure I'm going to. You know, uh, my freedom to just do what I want, you know, whenever I want, that's not going to happen anymore. All right? So then what I said is my life is going to change when I get married. Well, let me tell you something. When you become a Christian, your life will change. You know why? Because you left the father, the old father, the devil. You leave him, and now you're going to be married to Jesus Christ. And guess what? We are the bride of Christ, so we have to submit to the Lord, to what he wants for our lives. That's what happens. You say, well, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to get saved, but I just don't want to change. I just don't want to give up my worldly past. You know, the things that my father, the devil, provides for me that I enjoy. Oh, sorry. Not going to work too good. And, you know, there are people that do get saved and they mess around with sin afterwards, you know, with the old ways, and they never have a happy marriage. In context would be the, their relationship to Jesus Christ. So, your life is going to change when you get married. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Turn there next. And by the way, I just I just want to say real quick too on the note of, of my upcoming marriage, I thank you to everybody that wrote and said, you know, we'll be praying for you and wish you well and everything. Uh, thank you for that. First uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, verse one. And here we're going to see again this thing of God's created order. God, man, woman, children. That's the way God has worked it out. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There again you see the thing of Jesus being the one mediator between God and man. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man." Now, a lot of people take that to mean physical covering. You have the Mennonites, they put a little thing on their head and stuff like that, and the men take their hat off before they pray. Now, I do believe you should take your hat off before you pray as a man, but this isn't, it, this isn't talking about a physical covering. This is talking about spiritual coverings. Go back there to verses 3 and 4. And we're not going to get into all this. I did this in another study. But the point is, if I were, were to go to a Catholic priest, some dirty sex pervert, and I was to go to him and say, uh, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned, you know, blessed be your name or whatever they say, you know, I'm dishonoring Jesus Christ by that. If you have something that you need to pray about, don't come to me and say, Lord, I come to you in the name of Brian Denlinger and, and, and don't do that. There's not supposed to be anybody between you and Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you're a woman, you can still pray to God through the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that. But the point is, as a woman, your spiritual head is going to be your husband if you're married. If you're still a single woman living at home, then it's your father. Or if you're a single woman that isn't living at home, well, then it would be your pastor. All right? And you can ask their advice and things like that. You can still pray to God through Jesus Christ. But this is talking about spiritual headship there. That's the whole issue. And you see again that women are not supposed to be above men in when it comes to spiritual authority. Now look at verse 8. And again, you're going to see here the great mystery of Ephesians 5.32. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. 
Neither was the man created for the, for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Okay? Again, this is not a demeaning thing for women. It's an honor. But uh, verse 11 there. Neither is the, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. What good would your life be without Jesus Christ? <laughs> Not very good at all. Um, and you know, there's a the statement. It's kind of funny because it's like you know you see here the thing about uh, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And of course, that's talking. You know, you could refer that back to uh, Adam and Eve. Adam was created first. Eve was created as a helpmeet for him. It wasn't the woman that came first and then the man. It was the other way around. And also with our salvation, Jesus wasn't created for us. We were created for him. So you've got to get a hold of that thing. But, you know, again, you see this thing of it's not this dishonor that the Lord's trying to put on you. You know, life wouldn't be very much if there weren't women and men. Okay? Uh, it's kind of like the old uh, saying, if your parents don't have children, neither will you. <laughs> so, something to think about. That's really profound, I know. But uh, the great mystery of Christ is about our relationship to Him. And, of course, you can apply that to marriage. So, what about the thing of a woman pastor? I need to show that God's system there of the roles that men and women are supposed to have in His design. Now, if you follow God's design, as I said, it's God, man, woman, children. But if you follow the feminist design, it's God, woman, men, children. They switch it. They mess with it. And I have a whole sermon on the sin of feminism. And you can listen to that thing if you want more details into the whole feministic system. But uh, you say, well, it's, you know, to me it's really not an issue. People say, well, you know, what do you think about female pastors? Well, you know... What do you think about grass being green or the sky being blue? You know, read 1 Timothy chapter 3. Qualifications for a bishop, for a pastor, very clearly only for a man. Unless you choose to use something else. I'm going to do this real quick here. We have here the 2011 NIV. It's kind of interesting, actually, because I'm hearing that there are actually some churches that won't use this thing. NIV churches, they're saying we'll stick with the old NIV. <laughs> Which is really kind of interesting, you know. Because this is the NIV people that are bringing it out. You know, and they're trying to get rid of this is a feminist. They're mixing feminist and then the old NIV. Whatever. Bunch of garbage. But we'll read here, see how they change things. Actually, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want you to be able to read along. As we're going through this, I meant to say that. First Timothy chapter three. You're going to see this is very interesting stuff here. I'm probably not going to read all of these uh, verses just simply because it's. I don't want to uh, read too much garbage over the air. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 in the 2011 NIV. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. doesn't say if a man anymore. It's just whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. But then what they do is it goes on, it says, verse 2, now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. It's like, okay, it says his wife there. Why not just leave it if a man? Why change it? Why take the word man out? doesn't make any sense. It's kind of ridiculous. And I'm going to show you that the newer ones actually do remove all the references to men. But uh, we'll go down here. We'll jump down through. Like I said, I don't want to read this whole thing. Um, but verse 11, it says here, uh, in your King James, it says, even so must their wives be grave. Okay, the, the wives of the deacons. This 2011 NIV says, 
In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect. Hmm. The women? See, it's talking about the uh, deacons up there, and then it says the women down there. It changed it from wives to women. Why? Well, because that way you can read this thing and you can say, hmm, maybe it could have a, a female deacon up there. Because it just goes down and says women are to be worthy of respect. doesn't say their wives. See how they change that thing? So with the 2011 NIV, if you don't like your King, the King James Bible, you can just go pick this thing up. And you, you know, you're still going to have a hard time proving female pastors, but you can have female deacons. There's no condemnation anymore for a female deacon in the 2011 NIV. And by the way, the word man has been taken out thousands of times. I documented that with the two, with the uh, today's New International Version, and most of those changes they've actually left in this newest NIV. But now we're going to go to another garbage new version. This is the Message Remix. I'm sure everybody's excited about this one. All right, leadership in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3. If anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. <laughs> yeah, but there are preconditions. A leader must be well thought of, committed to his wife. Again, they can't totally pervert everything they have to leave it in there. It says committed to his wife. So why take out man from verse 1? You say, well, you know, they're just trying to clear it up. No, there isn't. No, they aren't. This is an agenda. Why take out man from verse 1 when verse 2 goes on to say committed to his wife? See, it's messed up. Then it goes down here to... Uh, this thing's so hard to interpret because they don't have the verse numbers with the text. But uh, verse 8, I believe it is, says here, The same goes for those who want to be servants in the church. Not deacons anymore, servants. Uh, serious, not deceitful, not too free with the bottle. <laughs> not too free. You can you know, still drink and stuff, just not too free with it. Not in it for what they can get out of it. They must be reverent before, before the mystery of the faith, not using their position to try to run things. Let them prove themselves first if they... Show they can do it. Take them on. No exceptions are to be made for women. Same qualifications. Huh? Hmm. Don't make any exceptions for women. They have the same qualifications as the men. Huh. Serious, dependable, not sharp tongue, not over fond of wine. Over fond of wine, yeah. Servants, servants in the church are to be committed to their spouses. Hmm. Okay, so in other words, it's no longer the deacon, the wife wife of the deacon. It's just servants are to be committed to their spouse. Interesting. But it gets even better, or even worse, I guess you could say. Here we have the Common English Bible. This one had Jesuits sitting on the translation committee. Proven fact, I show the thing on video. I document it from their own website. There were Catholics. I mean, just, you talk about a horrible gathering of, of apostate scum. <laughs> Sorry, but they were. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This saying is reliable if anyone has a goal to be a supervisor in the church. They want a good thing. Now remember the other one said, his wife? Listen to this. So the church's supervisor must be without fault. They should be faithful to their spouse. And then it goes on, your King James Bible and even these new versions will say he, he, his, you know, whatever. This thing has replaced all the words he and his with they. Isn't that interesting? So if you want to be a female pastor, all you got to do is find the right new version. Don't tell me there's no agenda behind these new versions. And this thing's very new. They just came out with the newest one, the, the full. This is just New Testament here. But they just came out with the full one like, couple months ago or a year ago i can't remember which just incredible what about deacons verse 8 in the same way servants in the church should be dignified not two-faced heavy drinkers or greedy for money they should hold on to the faith that has been revealed with a clear conscience they should also be tested and then serve if they are without fault in the same way women who are servants 
Hmm, women who are servants in the church should be dignified and not gossip. They should be sober and faithful in everything they do. Servants must be faithful to their spouse. There you have it. You see, your King James Bible is crystal clear. There's not even a need for argument. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, my other sermon I did the one time, the sin of Sodom. What was the sin of Sodom? What they would call gay today or homosexual today. There's no argument. Well, you know, maybe we get no, arguments over. Sodomy is a sin. According to your King James Bible, the Bible is very plain. Preachers, pastors, excuse me, pastors are to be men. But you can go off and you can find a new version to justify your sin. See, that's where we're at. That's why I take such strong stands against these new versions. There is a satanic be agenda behind them. But now look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the women, or let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Could it be any plainer than that? Women are to be silent in the church. They are not to teach or usurp authority over the man. Remember God's created order? God, man, woman, children. You cannot switch those roles. If you do, you are in, in disobedience to God. Just as plain as you can make it. 2011 NIV. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And people go, oh, okay, that's all right. Just one problem, though. Right beside the word man, there's a little B for a footnote. You could jump down to the footnote and it says, or over her husband. Hmm. So if you're a woman, you're allowed to have authority over men, but, or, or, or you know, but they, well, according to that thing, it says they're man, but you jump down to the footnote, it says, or over husband. So a woman could read it and she could jump down to the footnote and say, well, man there in context just means my husband. So while I should be submissive to my husband, I can rule over the men at church. See? Again, they're justifying it with this thing. How about the message? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. I don't let women take over and tell the men what to do. They should study to be quiet and obedient along with everyone else. What about I suffer not a woman to teach? Hmm. Somehow that uh, Eugene Peterson here, he must have forgot that part. Wonder if that would be maybe because he's a college professor at some apostate wicked thing up in Canada. And there's probably female professors up there. No, I doubt that had anything to do with it. Uh huh. The Common English Bible. A wife should learn quietly with complete submission. I don't allow a wife to teach or to control her husband. Not a woman, a wife. So you could say, well, I won't control my husband, but I will control the men at my church that I pastor. See? That's what these new versions are doing. But let's look here. Let's read these verses. And this is this is interesting stuff here. First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven through fourteen. Let the women or let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now this is very interesting stuff here. Why was Eve deceived by Satan? Well, because women are created for the home, they are the ones that are loving and kind to children. Most women don't like to think badly of other people. You know, women are a lot more loving, a lot more accepting, a lot more gentle. Most men are like, you know, we think the worst of a lot of people. <laughs> you know? We're a lot quicker to be ready to fight than a woman is. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Jump up there, actually, two verses. 
uh, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now here's where it gets interesting. Here's where we're going to get into the thing of seducing, you know, using powers of seduction and how women can actually do that. And this is one area that most, well, not most, all women are ignorant of. And I say that being as nice as I can. Women don't really understand what goes through a man's mind. They can say that they kind of do, but a woman who's dressed immodestly does not know the kind of thoughts that men around her are having. They don't understand the thing of what happens when a man starts to burn with lust. And we're not going to get into all those uh, verses and things in, in Scripture, but there are many times when a man will burn and, you know, the fact is, if you look at the proofs of history, and this is all through your Bible, if you look, when law and order breaks down, like when you have a war, what's one of the things that happens to women? The Bible says they are ravished. We would call it rape today. Why? Because that's the way a lot of men are. And you get an unsaved man who's wicked and everything, the thoughts that are going through his head, if a woman could hear those thoughts and, and read that those men's mind out there, they'd be real careful how they dress. Let me tell you. I mean, there's probably some that, that would you know be into that or something like that. But the fact is, women don't really understand what goes through the mind of a man. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that a man, on the other hand, will learn how to spot a wolf in sheep's clothing and not be afraid to call him out. Why? Well, we understand. A man understands other men's minds. We're not deceived by it. We're not, you know, oh, he looks like a nice man, you know. I hear that, you know, from, from women, you know. Oh, he looks nice. Well, why? Well, he has a nice smile, you know, <laughs> or nice eyes or something. It's like you don't know what's behind that smile or those eyes. And you could see a guy in a three-piece suit that would, if he had the chance, well, I won't even say what some of them would do. All right? But uh, can a woman use her body to charm or bewitch a man? Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to go way back into the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Like I said, modest apparel is very, very important, and a lot of women don't understand that. And especially now, we have professing Christian women that do not understand why they should be dressing in modest apparel. But uh, here in these verses, we're going to see some of the things that are used in what we would call occult practices. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all, all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So you see those things in there. Let's go through that list. And if you see anything like that, you shouldn't be messing with it as a Christian. And one of the most vile, blasphemous movies out there, and, I, and I've done a lot of research into it, and wanted to bring something out on it. I haven't done it yet, but The Lord of the Rings. They say Gandalf the wizard is a type of Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, okay, no he isn't. I mean, that that would be, if, if that was true, it would be the most vile blasphemy that there is. The Bible says that you're not to seek after wizards to be defiled by them. A wizard is not something that God says, oh, you can be a Christian wizard or something. No. The things in this list are, are things that we as Christians should stay away from. Again, the very first new versions that came out, the 1881 revised version, Westcott and Hort were both into necromancy. Contacting dead spirits. The Ghostly Guild and the Hermes Club, they were part of those things. 
And, you know, I've heard Christians try to defend that. Oh, it's just kind of an innocent thing that they did, you know, seances and stuff like that, trying to contact the dead. We should stay away from this as Christians. But notice a couple things there. An enchanter, a witch, a charmer. Did you know that women can have can actually use their powers of seduction over men? There are women that know they can dress a certain way and act a certain way and kind of look at a man a certain way and you know kind of wink their eyes and stuff and they can get they can tap into that part of a man that burns and hit into his lust and through that they can actually control the man and they understand that that's why they call him a charmer and that is an occult satanic power that a woman can use you know and there's women that are that are like I said, ignorantly going out and dressing very seductively and in a way that their body's showing and they don't even realize that they are actually employing these types of things. And they might not be trying it. They might not be trying to get that kind of attention. But as a woman, the reason you're supposed to dress modestly is because there are men out there that will be attracted to you even if you don't pay them attention. If you are showing your body as a woman and going out there, you're going to get men coming after you. You know, it's like the old saying, if you hang out a piece of meat, you're going to attract dogs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you figure it out. <clears throat> Judges chapter 14. Just a couple books over. Actually, you have Deuteronomy, then you have Joshua, then you have Judges. Judges chapter 14. We're going to see a good example of this. The story of Samson. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. It says here, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. The Jews were at war with the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Notice he did not say, Hey, we had a really good conversation. And I think she wants to convert to Judaism or something like that, you know, and she just, we have so much in common. Uh, -uh. he saw her and he said, I want her. Didn't matter, you know, what her feelings were or beliefs were or anything else. I mean, this is an enemy of the Jewish people, the Philistines, the people, the very people that they were at war with. The Philistines were constantly fighting with Jerusalem. And yet he looks and he sees a girl and he lusts after her and he says, I want her. You got to get her for me. What was going on there? Do you think she was modestly apparelled? I doubt it. They were pagans. The, the Philistine people were pagans. So she probably had a lot of her flesh exposed. And Samson began to burn in his lust towards her. And he said, Oh, I got to have her. She has to become my wife. See that power of seduction, that power of charming. Go to Judges chapter 16, verse 1. And you say, well, then they, they got married and lived happily ever after, right? No. They did get married and then they actually split up. And look what happens here. I'll show you again Samson. <laughs> then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. What is, he, what is his criteria for finding a woman? Lust. <laughs> Looking and seeing and, oh, wow, you know what? And he lusts after her. And again, don't tell me that these girls were just modestly apparelled and just kind of going around and, you know, whatever. Especially this one here. Next, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 7. You say, what's this have to do with female pastors? Well, you'll see in a minute. I'm getting around to it. Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 6. And of course, you know, I've heard this thing from some women. They say, clothing is neutral. 
you know, men don't have to look. You can wear whatever you want. And, you know, if a man lusts, well, that's his problem or something like that. There's no such thing as, as the wrong type of clothes. Well, we're going to see about that. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6. For at the window of my house, I looked through the ca- through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner and he went the way to her house in the twilight in the evening in the black and dark night and behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart now that has been a well-known thing down through the centuries women that were harlots prostitutes that sold their body for money they wore certain clothing to advertise Now, we have a situation here in modern-day America where many women wear the attire of an harlot, what would have been considered the attire of an harlot years ago. They wear it, and they don't even think anything of it. I mean, you take somebody from two or three hundred years ago, and you bring them forward to today, they'd be like walking around out in public going, man, you know, there's like all harlots here, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Every woman I see is a harlot. (laughs) That's what they'd be saying. So what's going on there? Well, you have this woman, she dresses a certain way to seduce, to gain control. And we're not going to read all the verses here, but you continue reading down through there, verses 11 through about 20, she does seduce him. And she gets him in. Look at verse 21. And this is very interesting here. Verse 21. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart declare or decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Now, why did I say that that verse 21 is very interesting? With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. Now, what would happen if you had an attractive woman standing up in front of a congregation of men and women? Could she use powers of seduction to deceive the hearts of the men. Yeah. And I believe that some of these female pastors, there's some of them out there that are very pretty. Some of them are just, you know, ugly as, you know, they're, they're very homely looking and whatever. But you have some that are very pretty. And I think that they use powers of seduction over the men. And actually the sister that wrote to me said that she has a, a male friend that goes to a church that has a female pastor. And she said she cannot say, you know, he won't say a, one bad word about that woman. And this woman, this sister that wrote to me, was actually a formerly a witch. And she said, it's almost like this female pastor has a spell cast over those men. And I do believe that they do a lot of times. I do believe that they do use powers of seduction. I mean, you get a woman up there walking around and she has almost a mini skirt on or something like that or tight clothing. There's going to be men there that are going to be looking at her and lusting the whole way through that sermon. But they're going to be justifying, oh, she's my pastor. And what does she, what's she going to use? Fair speech. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What did it say in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 7? And I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. Did you know there are a lot of simple-minded people out there who profess to be Christians? And they go into these churches to, I'm sorry, but a lot of times a harlot that's up there showing her body off using powers of seduction. And through her fair speech, she deceives them. Pretty bad. Uh, let's see here, where am I at? Revelation chapter 2. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that we're seeing more and more news anchors being basically supermodels? You look at these women that are now reporting the news, and they're like these ultra-beautiful women with low-cut tops on and things like that, wearing the attire of an harlot. And they're reporting to you the news. Uh huh. You go back in the 1950s, 1960s, it was old men, you know, Walter Cronkite, you know, it was this grandfatherly, fatherly type of figure. Now you got these these good-looking young women with, uh, you know, lip gloss on and everything, and they're talking seductively to the camera. I'm reporting the news to you. Yeah, uh huh. You're reporting propaganda, you know. <laughs> and what are they going to do to the to the people? Well, they're deceiving them, deceiving the hearts of the simple. But let's look here at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. I'm going to see some interesting things here. The church of Thyatira. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Now look at verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to, do, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But I just wanted to read that whole passage there. But the point is, verse 20, you need to notice a couple things. This spirit of Jezebel, that woman Jezebel, calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and she seduces God's servants to commit fornication. You say, well, what's that about? Is that, you know, you're saying that these female pastors are causing their people to commit fornication? Well, not necessarily physical fornication. There's other types. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5 says, And there, com there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now we've I did have a whole study on that. Who's this talking about? The Roman Catholic Church is Revelation chapter 17, Mystery Babylon. And I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of these female preachers, pastors, I should say, are causing the people that are in there under their authority to spiritually go back under Roman Catholic authority. A lot of these women pastors are pro-Roman Catholic. They will not stand up there and rebuke the Catholic Church. A lot of them won't do that. Say, oh, let's join hands with the Catholics. You know, I have a video showing there was a, a Mennonite Central Committee here locally. There was a woman that was a, a Mennonite pastor or something. Now she's a Roman Catholic. She converted to Roman Catholicism. And what's she doing? She's seducing and she's teaching her people to commit fornication with that Roman Catholic Church. To join with them. To join hands with them. Very, very bad. Now, very quickly here. 
This is the last time I'm going to do this uh, today. 2011 NIV. I'm going to go here to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. Of course, you know it's going to be messed up. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Here's your 2011 NIV. Now notice a couple things. Your King James Bible says she calls herself a prophetess. The NIV says, where is it here? Who calls herself a prophet? They remove the word prophetess. Also, it says in the King James, it says seduce. 2011 NIV says mislead. There's a big difference between seduction and misleading. A very big difference. Uh, the Common English Bible. Hit this thing real quick. 20. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking chapter 20. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. But I have this against you. You put up with that woman Jezebel, Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. You allow her to teach and to mislead my servants. They do the same thing as the NIV. Sounds very much like the 2011 NIV. What about the message? Of course, we can always trust the message. This is one of the most orthodox Bibles out there. I think the only thing good, the only good use for the message is if you need to get a good laugh. Uh, verse 20. But why do you let that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet mislead my dear servants into cross-denying self-indulging religion? Okay. <laughs> Boy, that that's really clear. Yeah. But uh, I want to read something here quick just to show you why they removed the word prophetess and why they removed the thing about seduction. I have here a, this is a, uh, you can post your resume online. This is some interesting stuff here. And uh, now if you need, if you need to have a, a woman pastor, here's one for you. You can uh, hire her. She is an ordained prophetess, pastor with an apostolic mantle. Wow, you know. And she's expecting a salary of between forty and fifty thousand dollars a year, you know. Quite a bargain. <laughs> she says here, My background consists of a wide range of ministry experience. I have been given the opportunity to provide leadership, administration, teaching. And then she goes on list a bunch of other stuff. Hmm. Well maybe if she read the King James Bible she would see that she's not supposed to be doing those things. Leadership and teaching. And by the way, women can teach other women. Women can teach children. But women are not supposed to be up front teaching and usurping authority over the man. Experience. Uh, she served in ministry as ordained pastor and ordained prophetess. Okay? Now, there were prophetesses in the Old Testament. But there are no prophetesses in the New Testament. And especially an ordained prophetess. That's nonsense. But now this, listen to this group that she was part of. Beauty to Behold, Christian Abortion Support Group. Isn't that a nice thing to be part of? You can have an abortion as a Christian and we'll be here to hug you and support you. Yeah. Disgusting. She's an author. Jewels in My Vessel and Flames of Love. You can kind of work that one out yourself. I'm not going to even try to think of what that is. Education, 1998 through 2006, Eagle Christian College, Marion, Ohio, School of the Prophets, School of the Apostle, and Bible Studies. <laughs> Here we have the homepage of uh, the school of Eagle Christian College, excuse me, and it's, it's Eagle and Lion Christian College. Uh, they, they have another branch there. Um, and it's it's run by Dr. Pat Watson, a woman. Go figure, you know. 
She says here, Our vision is an equipping school where training is done in a Holy Spirit atmosphere where the Spirit of God is allowed to flow out of each heart and life. Training involves study, mentoring, interaction, and impartation. Lamad learning, the Hebrew word, involves interaction and personal encounter with Jesus, the living truth. We offer general and specialized classes. There are at least at a lower there are at a lower cost and at or these, I'm sorry, these are at a lower cost and at an academic level where everyone may benefit. Blah blah blah. Our key Bible verse is to present every man and then they have person perfect in Christ Jesus. Colossians one twenty eight. So they actually have to change the text right on the main page of their university. Because they don't like the word man. They say person. You, know, you have to be politically correct. I mean, you just think, you know, you're not supposed to be offensive as a Christian. Our doctrinal position and philosophy. Our battle cry is your glory, Jesus. Our passion is to make Jesus famous. We want to make it hard for people to go to hell by making Jesus famous. Yeah. Here's some of their, these are our values, expressions of quality. They are passionately important to us. Each person experiences the Bible as the basic guidebook in order to love God by obedience in being baptized in water and the Holy Spirit. Then Bible revelation guides us to be a cutting edge church that grows brighter and brighter in Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Next one. Each person learns to pray in the Holy Spirit, including speaking in tongues. We do informed intercession then. How did I know that that was going to be part of this thing? Each person experiences music and the arts to celebrate praise, to do spiritual warfare, and worship God. Uh, they, for some reason, they don't have a scripture reference with that one. Music and the arts to experience God. Okay. Number nine. Each person experiences the voice of God. So you go around saying, I hear voices in my head. <laughs> nice. And then the last one here, each person impacting people through the saints movement by receiving equipment, equipping from the Ephesians 4.11 leaders of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher to be empowered for a life of service, experiencing signs, wonders, and miracles. You see, these people are already worshiping the Antichrist. They're just waiting for him to show up. I want signs, wonders, and miracles. Well, you ought to read the Bible and see that that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to bring. The wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. One more thing here. Our Bible beliefs at Eagle Christian College. Our basic doctrine and paradigms. Watch out for that word. New age term. Our basic doctrine and paradigms are of the evangelical, relational, Holy Spirit, faith, and re restorational movements a Bible-based Christianity, where we are a long-term members of the National Association of Evangelicals. And if you want to study a wicked organization, those people are wicked. National Association of Evangelicals used to be headed by, uh, what's that guy's name? The guy that got caught uh, with a male prostitute. Ted Haggard, that's what it was. Spiritual organization, fine Christian man. Uh -huh. This one I love. Now remember, these are this woman's a charismatic, okay, an ultra radical charismatic. I mean, this woman's not even saved. There's no way this woman's a Christian with all the wicked stuff she does. But what do the charismatics believe? They believe in speaking in tongues and they believe in divine healing, okay. License and ordination. She's a licensed evangelist. From 1995 to 1998 is when she was licensed. Ordained pastor, 1998. Ordained prophet, 2007. CPR and first aid, June 16th, 2008. Hmm. Think about that. Why do you need CPR and first aid if you have the powers of healing? Raise them from the dead. <laughs> I mean, come on. As a seasoned soldier in God's army, prophetess Pastor Brackman's story is amazing and wonderful. And this is her name. Blossom Brackman was ordained as a prophetess in 2007 and was commissioned by Israel as a watchman on the wall in the fall of 2006. That's interesting because Israel right now spiritually is our enemy. You know? 
According to the election, they're, they're beloved of God, but according to the gospel, they're our enemies. Why would Israel ordain this woman? Hmm. Or commission, excuse me. Prophetess Pastor Blossom also holds an ordained ministry license by Kingsway Fellowship International located in Des Moines, Iowa. Throughout her life, she struggled with physical, emotional, and spiritual abuse and was healed in one day after an encounter with God. What about salvation through Jesus Christ? I had an encounter with God. I heard a voice in my head. You know, yeah. But anyhow, it goes on there. I'm not going to read all of it. Um, she's president and founder of Walking with God Kingdom Institute, mini Bible certificate school that teaches on the prophetic gifts and the gifts for the body of Christ in order to prepare and send forth apostles to bring Christ's love, the uncompromised truth of his word and his heart to the world. Isn't that interesting how these people lie like that? The uncompromised truth of his word. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. So there you have it. You know, if you're looking for an ordained prophetess pastor with an apostolic mantle, there you go. You know, you can just go here and I'll send you the link. You know, if you're well, if you have fifty thousand dollars a year to waste. Yeah. If you want my opinion, I believe she sounds like a first rate witch. Is what I believe. And I'm not just using that as an adjective. I'm using that as I believe she's a witch. You got to watch out for some of these women. And you get a woman pastor like that, and she gets up there, and it, you know, I, some guy sent me this thing, this woman charismatic, and she was saying how that they're going after the kids in the preschool thing at this church, and how we get them to speak in tongues, and we we're teaching them the apostolic signs and wonders and stuff. I wouldn't let that. I wouldn't let that woman in the door of this place. Okay, out, out you go. And I'll tell you right now, that woman is a pastor. And you better be real careful when you get one of these women up there that say that they're a pastor. Because I believe that they use occult powers of seduction to get control of these people. And this woman, when she's up there speaking, this just ridiculous blasphemy. She has hundreds of people out in the congregation. They're just going wild and clapping and, oh, you know, what's going on? I believe she was a seducing female pastor, is what I believe. Second Peter chapter two. I'm going to show you something here. Very interesting. Second Peter chapter two, verse fifteen. All right. You say, well, did God ever use a female pastor? Yep. Actually, God did. God did actually speak audibly through a female at one point in time. We're going to read about that. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. You say, well, what on earth is this about? Well, if you can go back to Numbers chapter 22, we're not going to go there today for sake of time, but Numbers chapter 22, you can read the story of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet and, and he was going along and he was not listening to God and he was riding on a donkey. Now your King James Bible word for donkey is ass. Okay? Not profanity. It's what the Bible says as that word. Numbers twenty two twenty eight says, And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? She saw an angel up ahead and she kept trying to turn aside and he would, you know, whack her with a stick or a whip or whatever. And she actually turned around and spoke to him. And I actually have heard female pastors use this passage to justify them preaching. But there's a problem with that. Look at verse 16 here in 2 Peter chapter 2. Okay, you have Balaam there in verse 15. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with Man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. God used a female donkey, but used a man's voice to speak through her. That tells you what God thinks of a female pastor. He used the one time that he used a woman to preach his word, he changed the voice to a man's voice. Hmm, isn't that interesting? And, you know, it's kind of interesting because a lot of... I just want to make a point here while we're here. 
a lot of Christians will blush over things like this. I actually heard people make fun of the King James Bible because it says dumb ass there. And they'll say, oh, you know, and they got it. Oh, that's embarrassing. And oh, dumb means that it can't speak. And ass is the Bible word for a donkey. All right. And it's funny because people that will bring that up have no problem watching Hollywood movies or television. You know, I've had these modern Christians hold your, your Bible says, you know, it has ass in it. Ooh. Well, you watch that movies all the time and you listen to it and you don't have a problem with that. Why would you blush or, or make a little thing about the King James Bible? Well, because they're hypocrites. Look over chapter 3, verse 16. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Now this is where we're going to end the sermon today because this is some good Scripture to keep in mind. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. The King James Bible is not really that hard to understand in many places, but they change it. They rest it. Okay? They mess it up because they don't like it. And it's not a sign of spirituality when somebody messes with this book. It's a sign of them, uh, says there, they that are unlearned and unstable. I'm a Bible scholar. I'm a New Version scholar. Well, you're unlearned and unstable according to Scripture. Right there. And what happens as a result? It leads to their own destruction. Verse 17, Ye therefore, or ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Don't even listen to female pastors. You hear them? Don't even listen. Don't say, well, maybe I get something good out of it. Just run away from them. Verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The King James Bible is God's word for the English-speaking people. He settled it. He preserved it. You shouldn't be messing around with these new versions. You will be led astray. And you are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth on the front of this pulpit. That's one of the most important verses of Scripture because your faith, your knowledge is supposed to be dependent on this book. Not on what people think or on what your feelings are. Or I heard a voice in my head, you know. It's supposed to be written Scripture is your final authority. Now, if you are listening to this sermon and you have a female pastor, you can see 1 Timothy chapter 3, there is absolutely no way possible to fit a woman pastor into that passage. There's no way. Now, you need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are in one of those churches, leave. You say, well, you know, should I like tell them I'm going to leave eventually? Leave. Now. Okay, if you're listening to this and you're saying, you know, it's a you have a day or so till you're going to go, don't ever go back. You know, if, if you're there, or you, you're listening to this on a Sunday afternoon and you're supposed to go back tonight, don't go back. Flee. Get away from them. Avoid them, as it says there in Romans chapter 16. Just get away from them. Break that spell of seduction. She's not your friend up there. There's no such thing as a legitimate female pastor. I don't even care if she uses a King James Bible. I don't care what she says. I don't care how nice a person she seems. You are under her spell right now if you respect a female pastor because the Bible is so crystal clear that it's wrong. You need to leave. You cannot stay and be right with God. It's just as simple as that. So, that's going to be it for this morning. And I'll tell you right now, as this apostasy increases, you're seeing more and more female pastors. And these big, wicked Protestant denominations that have come out of the Roman Catholic whore, a lot of them, now the heads of these denominations are women. You know? Man, you wouldn't catch me dead in these churches. No way. So, if you are in one of those churches, get out. If you're listening to one of these female pastors, stop listening immediately. Your spiritual life is in great, great danger. 
So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.